we're gonna do. He's gonna uh, give his talk, Luke will give his talk, and then they will join a panel. So that's when we start uh, giving the microphones around for you guys to ask questions, all right? So please, Jeff Merrick. Oh, I guess I don't need it. Thank you. Hello. Hi. Yeah, testing. How you guys doing? Awesome. Glad to hear it. I'm doing pretty good. This is my fifth conference in eight days, starting in Freedom Fest in Las Vegas on last Friday, and then the Infinite, Infinite Man Summit in Lisbon, Portugal, and then I went and I spoke at a Liberland uh, a diplomatic event in London, and then Anarca Portugal in Porto, Portugal, uh, two days ago, and now I'm here. So this is the, it's a, uh, uh, conference week here on the Jeff channel. <laughs> it's, uh, it's, uh, it's, it's the most I've ever done, uh, but I'm actually feeling pretty good. So, uh, and it's beautiful here, so it's, it's kind of nice to kind of wrap it up here, not in London or someplace like that where it's just stress and chaos. So it's nice being by a lake here and uh, in this sort of environment as well with these sort of people. <clears throat> and that's sort of a little bit what I want to talk about is how crypto is really changing everything and why this is way bigger than what most people even have any idea about. There's some people out there in 2018 who still think crypto is like Beanie Babies or a scam or a government inside job or <laughs> all of these uh, really uh, very delusional, <laughs> very ignorant concepts on what's actually going on. But to me, this is very similar to the start of the internet, which I was around for. I was working at a bank, <clears throat> and I'd been a computer nerd my whole life. So I, w I, had, I was on a computer when I was about 11 years old in 1981. Back then, the only computer really you could get that was any decent was an Apple II Plus, and um, it had the green monitor, and there was no colors. <coughs> and um, Actually, my family couldn't afford the Apple II Plus, so my grandpa bought a Apple II Plus clone from Vietnam called a Unitron, uh, and I spent, I don't even know how many hours on that. And for most of my life, I was always on computers, and actually around 1992, I started to get a little bored of it because it hadn't really progressed. It was still bulletin board systems. You had to actually use your phone and like call <laughs> to get on what was the internet at the time. And it was a guy's house, and if someone else was on it, he'd get a busy signal, unless he had more than one line, which was like, wow, this guy's really hardcore. He's got like three lines for his bulletin board system. And I was actually getting a little bored of it, though, because nothing was t progressing too much. And I remember I was at a bank one day, and a guy named Ishmael from uh, Eritrea, who was working there with me, came up and he said, have you heard about the internet? And I said, no, what is it? And he said, they, they connected all the computers together. And right then I went, oh, finally, <laughs> they finally did it. I ran home, got on my computer, got, used the TCP IP SOC or whatever on Windows 95. Uh, or actually, I guess it was before that, Windows 3.1 probably back then. And got on and I went, this changes everything. This is the future right here. And I quit my job pretty much that day at the bank. They actually were just about to promote me to bank manager. I was only about 20, 23 years old. Or, or sorry, yeah, man, so long ago. <laughs> uh, yeah, I guess I was only about 24 or something. And uh, they were all proud. They were like, wow, you're, you're going to be the youngest bank manager we've ever had at this 300-year-old uh, bank in Canada called CIBC. And I said, well, how much does it pay? And they said, it's $30,000 $30, a year, Canadian which is about 15,000 US at the time. And I went, you know, I think I'm just gonna quit. <laughs> and I, I did, and they were shocked. They're like, we just gave you the biggest promotion that anyone's ever gotten in this bank and you're gonna quit? And I was like, yeah, I don't wanna be here forever. <laughs> uh, and I quit and I started an internet company and uh, it grew very quickly within a couple of years. It was the largest financial website in Canada and it still is to this day actually. It's called stockhouse.com. I ended up selling it after the tech bubble collapsed. But to me, the internet is so similar to what's going on in cryptocurrency. This is sort of 
A lot of people say 2.0 or 3.0 of the internet or whatever they want to call it. That's generally what I see as the cryptocurrency space. And most people out there still have no idea what's really going on. Of course, if you listen to governments and media, mainstream media, television programming, uh, they will tell you this is all just a bubble or it's just uh, Beanie Babies or oh, maybe it'll work, but it's, it's not a big deal. No, it really, it's uh, going to be so massive. It's already changing everything. Bitcoin itself already has threatened the entire monetary system of the world, the entire fractional reserve, central bank, fiat currency model is already in direct threat by Bitcoin or Bitcoin Cash or, or various other cryptocurrencies. But there's so much more to crypto than just the monetary uses. And of course, we're here, a pillar, uh, what they do. So many people are developing so many things on blockchain now that are going to change pretty much every facet of the way that business is done in every single way uh, for the foreseeable future. So this is absolutely massive. And it's really interesting to me because as an anarchist, as a person who believes that humans shouldn't be slaves, that's what an anarchist is, a lot of people used to say about us, yeah, you guys have these good ideas about you know, not wanting to rob people or kill people. Those are pretty good ideas. But you guys are all a bunch of broke guys. you know. And you really do need capital. You need currency. Currency is called currency for a reason. It's literally an exchange of human information and energy. And we didn't have a lot of that before. But now, thanks to cryptocurrencies, and the world hasn't realized this yet, and probably still won't realize it for a few more years, how much this has changed everything. Because we now have, I don't even know how many, tens of thousands, hundreds of thousands, millions of people all working, it's probably millions, working in these areas now. Many of them are not pro-government people. Uh, many of them are very libertarian, very anarchist. And they now have billions of dollars in combined capital to create the new world. A new world without having to sh fire one shot to get rid of these governments and central banks which have been plaguing humanity for the last few hundred years. This will be a very peaceful, it's not even a revolution because we're not going back anywhere, it's an evolution. And what has happened just with cryptos in the last two years, basically in the last year, because Bitcoin a year ago, what is it, July? I think it was around $600 a year ago. Uh, two, three years ago it was $100. With these things rising dramatically now, as people are catching on to what it is, it's created tens of billions of dollars, even hundreds of billions of dollars for the combined market cap of all the cryptos out there in capital that is mostly in the control of people who are not going to be continuing on with these governmental type systems, these central banking systems that are absolutely heinous and horrible and an absolute scam on humanity. Central banks alone have impoverished so many people. Uh, they have facilitated all the wars of the 20th century, Ron Paul has a great quote that says, it's no coincidence that the 20th century was the century of total war, it was also the century of central banking. Because you can't have these World War I and World War II and all these other wars without printing money. And the implicit theft that comes from inflation of all people to be used for the means of just a few people to do very quite evil things. So I come to conferences like this and I meet so many people like yourselves and I go, this is going to be amazing. I've been, as I mentioned, I've been to five conferences in the last eight days. Most of them are related to things like this. And I see what everyone's working on and it's so many things. And we just had this capital now for about a year of real uh, serious capital. I believe we're going to see in the next couple of years 
all the innovations and changes that will come because of this. You, as I said, we have probably millions of people now with hundreds of billions of dollars worth of capital all developing new systems right now. All outside the system, all without permission, to the point where I believe in the next few years, no one will believe how much it changed the world for the better. So I came here and they asked me to, to say uh, what I'd like to speak about and I asked them what do you think is a good topic and they said why don't you talk about entrepreneurship in the crypto space. I'm an entrepreneur. My first company as I mentioned was Stockhouse, uh, grew to about $240 million total market cap and then collapsed because I didn't understand, well I, I, I lost pretty much everything because I didn't understand how central banks worked. Someone gave me the book, The Creature from Jekyll Island, right after that, and it's a big book, but I finally finished it, and I went, oh, why didn't anyone tell me this is what central banking is? If I knew this, they would have changed everything. But for, for people out there who are wondering, especially younger people, what should I do with my life? I think the number one area, and I'm preaching to the choir here, obviously, is getting in, involved in any way in crypto and like blockchain technology, crypto, whatever you want to call it. Just like with the internet, I remember being around in 1993, 94, there was like Netscape, Mozilla. There was just a few little small companies. Amazon wasn't even around at that time. Um, what? Mosaic, yeah. The, the, the main search was Alta Vista and, and Yahoo. I don't think, does Yahoo still exist? I don't know, I haven't seen it in a long time. Um, but you can see what happened with the internet, how that changed the world. And you know, amazingly enough, when I was involved in it, and there's, there's a few interviews of me online, around the mid 90s, even the late 90s, where people were still questioning, is this internet thing really gonna catch on? It sounds a little bit like it's, it's a crazy um, thing. And there's actually a video of the Today Show with Bryant Gumbel, uh, in like 1994, where they just heard about email, and they were like trying to compute. They're like, how, how is this possible? You get mail, but without the postal service? It's like, they just couldn't get their heads around it. But you can see what happened with the internet. And even after that, that first collapse, after it skyrocketed, uh, called the tech bubble in the late 90s, uh, and then it had a massive collapse in uh, the very early 2000s. But Many people said then, well, I guess the internet's dead now. No, it's not dead. It, it, had, its, it had a bubble and it, and it went down. But look at the internet today. And look at our phones today. Everyone's on the internet. Uh, this doesn't need to be explained too much anymore. But even like Paul Krugman, who's <laughs> one of the, I don't even know how to describe him. <laughs> like ignorant isn't even, that'd be like a, a compliment. <clears throat> but he, he was, uh, in 1999, I believe was the year, that he said, we'll find out within a few short years that the internet will have been no more important to humanity than the fax machine. Uh, so this is what happens, and, and this is where we're at with the crypto right now. You still have many, uh, I think Paul Krugman, again, is against crypto, of course, um, and many people. And I've seen this before with the internet. I've seen people totally not seeing what's happening. And that's what's going on in crypto. So when it comes to crypto entrepreneurship, really, and I think I'm preaching to the choir here, just get involved in any way possible in this space. It'd be like getting involved in the internet in 1994. Now, of course, it's never going to be perfect. There's going to be lots of projects that fail. This is called the market. Probably 90% of projects, you know, it could be 80, 90, whatever the number is, but it'll be a lot. But that's normal. That's fine. And but there's going to be some massive winners. Those people who understand right now what's going to the importance of crypto will be so far ahead of the game. Because your average person, really, I travel the world a lot. Your average person has heard of Bitcoin. 
your average person definitely doesn't own any Bitcoin. And that's just Bitcoin. That's, what is it, nine years old now? Started in 2009, so. And still, it hasn't really reached your everyday person yet. But it will, in various forms. But we're still so early in this. But to see, and I go to some of these conferences, a lot of these conferences, obviously, and I see the excitement, I see the ingenuity, the innovation, the, the amount of people who are just working 18 hours every day on this stuff. And it's, it's partly because a lot of us really understand that this is more important than just making money or creating something interesting. This is world-changing technology. So we are still very early in this. So I think so many people have, are, are just at the stage right now where they're trying to think how they want to get involved in the ecosystem and things like that. And I think that's great. For those people out there who are, you know, younger people, and they've already gone through their 12 years of government indoctrination camps, the craziest idea I can think of is to sign up for four more years of the same indoctrination and propaganda and waste of time and actually pay for it into the hundreds of thousands of dollars now for a college degree, which, is there any colleges even talking about cryptocurrency? They're always so far behind the curve. So a lot of people will ask, you know, well, how do I really get into this stuff? Because there isn't a lot of colleges. There is a few that have started that are kind of called schools. Very early. Really just like anything. I remember when we were trying to figure out how to make a website in 1994, there was no schools. It was figure it out, ask people, go online. You know, there was nowhere to go really. But, uh, you know, just try to find the information one way or another. And that's really the case with the cryptos today. You really just got to be an autodidact, I guess is the word, and just learn it or, or hang around. For, for younger people out there, what I would suggest is if you're just looking at this and you're thinking, I want to get involved, but I don't know too much yet, just go to these sort of conferences, find out who's doing what, and offer, your, offer to work for them, even for free, for a period of time until you can learn enough to be of value to them. Those are some of the ways to get involved. But the opportunities are going to be infinite. They actually already are pretty close to infinite. We're still at a very early stage where people are just trying to figure out how this technology can be applied to so many different areas. And that's what things like Pillar are. They're, they're saying, okay, let's see if we can use blockchain technology uh, in terms of helping people with privacy. It's great. Uh, there's so many. Uh, one particular one that I'm incredibly bullish on right now and I get more bullish on it every day, is EOS. Was that a boo or? Did someone boo? Who booed? I'm just curious why. Who booed? Come on, you can't boo and not speak up. It's over here somewhere. I'm going to narrow it down. I'm not going to stop until we find out who booed. You're turning red. Was that you? Did you boo? Did you boo? Well, I don't know, but can you give me a few seconds why you would boo? Scalability. Scalability. Well, that's interesting. Yeah, there's a lot of things to think about in terms of these. All these things are brand new. EOS is one month old. Uh, you brought up scalability. I would have, I'm not a super techie guy, but I would say it seems a lot more scalable than, say, Ethereum. It can do many more transactions, but, you know, we don't have to get into technical details. And, of course, I could be totally wrong, but it, that's one that is really caught my interest because what I've seen is the ecosystem around it is absolutely massive. And there's literally thousands of people around the world all working on developing on this right now. And some of the smartest people too. So that's just one that I'm very interested in at the moment. There's so many that are very interesting. And of course, this is going to be massive changes. Just like I said with the internet, you know, it was Netscape and Mozilla and Mosaic and Alta Vista in 1994. Uh, they're all gone. And Yahoo, they're gone, I think. <laughs> but uh, 
yeah, we're going to have all kinds of, there's going to be some that are going to rise dramatically and just disappear. Um, maybe not disappear because that's one interesting thing about code or, or these sort of things in general. Even things like IRC, does everyone, anyone here know what IRC is? Inter Relay Chat, there's a few computer nerds here. That was like the very first thing on the internet where you could just communicate. It was like a, almost like a message board, I guess. Um, and it's still widely used by a lot of people. It just has never gone away, and it's very basic, and it has no graphical user interface that I've seen. It might, I don't know, I haven't used it in years, but I know that people still use it. What? Yeah, hackers love it, yeah. So that's sort of my point, like a lot of these cryptos, We've already seen a few that have kind of tried to do something. It's turned out to be a failure, but the coin's still there. And then the coin just is still there after time, and people start to use it for different things. It's, it's really fascinating. But yeah, there's going to be all kinds of opportunities, all kinds of big failures, big uh, success stories. But this is absolutely a great time to be involved in this space, uh, especially... Uh, I was one of the people saying when Bitcoin hit 20,000 in December, I came out with a video the day before it hit 20,000, I said, it's time to take profits. And I got just hammered on the internet. People were like, you're crazy, Bitcoin's going to a million dollars. And I, su I suggested buying some gold instead, taking some profits by gold, and everyone's like, gold is never going to go up. That's what happens with the markets. And your average person is isn't very smart. <laughs> and so you get all these commenters on YouTube, and yeah, these guys don't know anything, but uh, they just go with what they think is, is happening. And so everyone was super bullish on, not everyone, but the people in the space were really bullish on crypto and Bitcoin and uh, everything really, uh, in, up until about December. And then we had a, a major sell-off, that's good. That was very needed. Uh, you need these sort of things to happen, and we're gonna continue to have them. But I think, I feel much more confident right now with, Bitcoin around 7,000 and, um, for example, like Dash, it was up around 1,600. It's now around, I think, 300. I feel much more comfortable saying, if you haven't gotten into crypto, now is a good time to do it now. I was not saying that as much around December, uh, just because I knew we needed a sell-off. I think we've had most of the sell-off. Uh, we could have some more. It definitely is possible. Uh, I've been hoping to see Bitcoin down below 5,000, and I've got some capital just sitting there, just hoping it does. Uh, it didn't this time, it got down to about six, and then it's, it's risen now. Uh, we'll see what happens. It, it, you know, this is going to be very volatile for the foreseeable future. And even Bitcoin's a good example of how things can change. Even Bitcoin, which was the only crypto at the beginning, all of a sudden became the biggest crypto by far, and everyone was incredibly bullish on it, And but then, some things have changed with it over the last year, actually, since last July. When it forked, and there was two forks that came out of it, the Bitcoin fork and the Bitcoin cash fork, and, you know, people still dispute to this day which one's better or whatever. But yeah, we'll even see things like Bitcoin. Uh, you know, we're on sort of like the next level of crypto at this moment in time, and things like EOS and others, to me, have the potential to be that next Bitcoin especially with things like EOS that have no transaction fees for the end user. I think that's incredibly important if you're going to have mass adoption. That's, ab that's huge. That's the biggest problem with Ethereum. And I, I love Ethereum. I knew Vitalik before he even created Ethereum, and I knew it was going to be huge. You know, anyone who's ever seen Vitalik knows he's not fully human. He's from somewhere else, and he's like, his brain is so big. And I was like, yeah, whatever he does, get me into it. And so I recommend Ethereum at $2. But so some of the main issues are things like the gas fees. So you try to develop something on Ethereum, and you try to put it out to the public, like CryptoKitties, for example. Talking about scalability, right? Where, you know, you could say to your grandma, hey, there's something called CryptoKitties, do you want to buy one? And, you know, she might go, yeah, I love kitties, why not? And then she'd go, okay, so how do I do it? Well, you got to get some Ethereum. Okay, where do I get that? I don't know. <laughs> Maybe go to Coinbase, take you a while to set up because it's all government controlled. And then you can get some Ethereum on maybe Poloniex. Uh, then, you know, your grandma's already cross-eyed at this point. It's not going to happen, right? 
uh, those are some of the issues. So uh, whether it's EOS or other ones that come out with a way to do it without transaction fees for the end user, that will be massive. That was, of course, one of the biggest issues with the Bitcoin scaling issue was it became quite expensive uh, because of, uh, well, I won't get into the details of why that happened, but it did, and it was slow. So speed and transaction times. And if other new cryptos end up doing that better than Bitcoin, we could see Bitcoin go away. We're already kind of like almost seeing that with Bitcoin, Bitcoin Cash. Uh, it's, it's not for sure Bitcoin's going to be the big winner five years from now. There's, there's so many things going on. So that's where the opportunities are, is that all these things are changing dramatically every day. For your average person out there who's, should I go to college or, you know, what should I do with my life? Just get involved in this space. It's going to be absolutely massive. It already is pretty big. But your average person still has no idea about it. So it's still really like the 1993, 94 level when it came to the internet where I actually had a company in 1994 and we did websites uh, for once we figured out how to do websites. Um, so I'd go into uh, public companies that were on the stock market. It was an area that I was interested in at the time. And I'd go in, I'd say, hey, can I speak to the CEO? And they'd be like, yeah, sure, he's just down there. These small companies, they weren't big companies. And uh, I'd sit down, I'd go, hey, you should get a website. And the question in 1994 almost always was, what's a website? And I'd go, uh, it's on the internet. And they'd go, what's the internet? That's really where it was at back then. That's just generally where cryptocurrencies are at today. Your average person, and your average person is a person who's not at these sort of events, right? When we walk outside, ask the waitress, does she know much about Bitcoin? No. Uh, most people just still have not even realized anything about this space, but they will very quickly. And through all the innovations that are going to be coming, people will find ways to get these things more into the public's hands in ways that they're very um, open to using. A good example of things that, complete paradigm shifts in technology that changed everything, a good example is Uber. In fact, there's so many good examples. There's the biggest taxi company in the world today owns no taxis, it's Uber. Uh, the biggest hotel company owns no hotels, Airbnb. Uh, there's so many things like that. And what did it really take for your average person? They didn't need a big marketing campaign for Uber, but they just had an app and enough people started using it and they went, okay, I can get in this crappy, old, dirty uh, taxi that's run by the government uh, or heavily regulated by the government, or I can get in this nice car and the guy shows up, I know where he is. Once it became easy for the public to use, they just all started using it. There's no, it just happens almost that fast. Because your average person wants better things in their life, but they're not going to be downloading or buying a hardware wallet and figuring out how to save their seeds and all this sort of stuff. This is, we're still at the very early stage of this. Once it gets to the point where your average person, where your grandma is using crypto and she doesn't even know it, because it's just an app on her phone, or somehow it's, it's, it's become a technology that's so easy to use that she just starts using it, that's when the crypto stuff's going to go really massive. But we're still not at that stage. Even to this day, with things like Bitcoin and all that, it's not that easy still. It really isn't. But it will. It will get much, more e much easier, and it's going to be so many innovators out there that I've seen at all these conferences that are all working on stuff, some of these things are really going to uh, take this to the next level. And we're going to get there very quickly, in my opinion. It's only going to take a few years till crypto's a major part of life for most people in one way or another, even if they don't even know they're using it. Because really, it'll get to the point where people just have an app for something. They won't know it's a blockchain-based app. They won't know why that's even important. They won't understand centralization and decentralization, any of that stuff. But it will just offer a service that's just better than anything else out there. Because really, if you want to overthrow a system, you can't really do it by, 
you know, attacking that old system. You just have to create new systems that make the old systems obsolete. And that's what things like Uber have been. That's what Bitcoin is when it comes to money. Those of us who understand money and banking and business know that, for me personally, I use crypto for most things. Um, almost all my staff, uh, you know, people who work for me or with me, all get paid in crypto. I wouldn't, and they live all over the world, so if I had to actually do like a bank wire transfer every two weeks, it'd be a nightmare, but Bitcoin is just so much easier, or Bitcoin Cash or any of the other uh, cryptos. So I know I was going to talk a bit about entrepreneurship, and I, I did to an extent, but I'm on a panel after this. Luke Rodowski is talking next, and then Luke and I are on a panel. So if some people do have some entrepreneur questions, you have some business ideas, you want to bounce off me or, or anything like that, we can do that during the panel. Uh, I think I am out of time at the moment, though, so is anyone coming to get me or... Jeff, you're never oh, out you of time. <laughs> you're never out of time, and the stage is for you always. But thank you so much uh, for this thank talk. You. Big round of applause for Jeff. <laughs> <laughs> and now it's my pleasure to invite to the stage Luke Rutkowski, the brain and hands and the eye behind We Are Change. Uh, the man that is going in the place from everyone else is evacuating. I think that's a good person to tell us how to be an independent individual for the 21st century. Look, the stage is yours. Big round of applause. Thank you. Thank you so much for having me. With this being the unconference, I decided to come unprepared for my talk today. But <laughs> What's really interesting about me being here today, and I actually, I actually just realized this just yesterday when I was at the castle and I landed from Porto after being at Anarca, Portugal, is that about four weeks ago, someone in some country, which I don't even remember, at some conference was telling me about Pillar and this great new cryptocurrency and this advancements and being able to actually have your personal information stored on the blockchain. And I'm like, that's a really great idea. And I started thinking about it and I was like, I need to contact Pillar. I need to you know, figure out something, work with them. I worked with a lot of other cryptocurrencies before. I got officially sponsored by Dash. I'm gonna be doing projects with Smart Cash, which is an up and coming cryptocurrency that's really booming in Brazil right now. But Pillar was always in the back of my mind, but I always, I was always very busy and couldn't uh, find the time to reach out to the team. Uh, about a week ago, Jeff Berwick contacted me. He was like, hey, do you want to come speak in Lithuania at some conference? And I'm like, yeah, yeah, that sounds great. If they're going to have his crazy ass, they'll probably enjoy having me as well. Um, and I come here yesterday, and they're like, yeah, this event is sponsored by Pillar. So it's perfect that I'm here, it's perfect synchronicity, perfect manifestation where now I finally get to be here and I didn't even know that Pillar was a part of this event. Uh, so I'm very happy to be here. I'm gonna move around a little bit. I had a lot of grape juice yesterday. Uh, maybe even take a seat. But uh, with the email exchanges that were happening, they were, the organizers here were asking me what I wanted to speak about. And I do give many talks and I do give many lectures, but my main problem is I don't like deciding what I'm going to talk about until I actually get on stage. So it's always like, uh, I don't know. <laughs> um, you guys, you know, pick something. And they said, um, security. And I'm like, that's kind of the opposite of how I live my life <laughs> and what I truly believe in because, um, Throughout my life, there was times where I had a lot of money, very little money, where I had a staff of 30 people to two people, where I had good health, where I had bad health. And ultimately in life, you really have no security. And that is really telling also in the cryptocurrency space. Like I had someone defraud me for some Bitcoin. I know friends that lost 
over a half a million dollars because they got defrauded. And really, ultimately, there is no security. And if you want to be put in that kind of manifestation, kind of positive energy, this kind of fight or flight energy, you kind of have to let go and let the moment take you. So either I'm going to run off stage and not have anything to say, or I'm going to talk to you guys one on one and engage with you guys and then go off the speech that way. And to me, the whole illusion that, you know, people have of security is really ridiculous because you could try to control things, you could try to secure things, but life always finds a way to kick you in the butt and tell you no. <laughs> there is no security. There is no guarantees in life in all aspects of it, including in the very volatile cryptocurrency space where it goes from uh, 600 to 20,000 to 7,000 to 6,000, all in a spur of a moment. And really, once you fully just let go of that control and you learn to enjoy the ride, you really get put in the right positions and places in life to really direct you forward. And that's what I've seen a lot in the cryptocurrency community. Of course, there's a lot of people who just care about the money and getting rich and the Lambos and the women with the fake boobs. But really, ultimately, what the cryptocurrency community space was and is, is people who wanted to solve a problem. People who saw the private banking system and the damages that they were doing to our complete society ruining our lives and said, this is a way out. This is a solution that all of us could take part in that they can't destroy because all of our hands are in it. And really, personally, I think it would be interesting to share a story of where this whole security illusion kind of broke down for me. Um, because well, one way I learned that there is no security in life was when I was uh, very young and I had someone very close to me pass away, uh, who also was very young and it was a very tragic de death that happened. And it affected me very severely to where I had to drop out of class, I was dealing with depression, um, totally quit school, totally quit my job, was pretty much... Um, barely sleeping, but just dwelling and just barely eating and just sobbing around for months uh, in absolute misery, misery with the pain and suffering of losing someone that was extremely close to me. Um, and going through that experience, there was always this opportunity that arose that led to me doing my first ever video. And uh, I'm going to tell you the story of how I did my first ever video. Uh, when I was in that kind of depressed, lonely, sad slumber, uh, I'd, always, I'd always like walk around in my pajamas, sleep a few hours there and there, but I woke up you know, one day at like 4 o'clock in the afternoon, and there was a Polish newspaper there saying that Mr. Zbigniew Brzezinski is giving a speech today at 5 o'clock. I'm still in my pajamas. And I don't know if you guys are aware of who Zbigniew Brzezinski is. Raise your hand if you guys know who he is. Okay, not a lot of people know who he is. So Zbigniew Brzezinski is tied in with many different secret societies, the Trilateral Commission, Council on Foreign Relations, Bilderberg Group. He was Jimmy Carter's um, presidential advisor. He's the right-hand man to David Rockefeller and a lot of the elite kind of banking families that exist uh, within the banking structure of the entire world. So he's one of the top level guys who he himself, under the Jimmy Carter presidency, went to Afghanistan and then started the uh, Mujahideen, started the radical terrorists in order to fight the Russians. Um, me and my friend who passed away, we really cared about 9-11 and spreading the word about 9-11. Back then the internet wasn't um, as big and as popular as it is now. So if you wanted to get out ideas, you had to give out flyers, you had to give out DVDs. Um, video capabilities weren't as powerful and it wasn't easy to even be a video producer because of the equipment and the software you needed. So my main thing was always talking to people about 9-11 and informing them about the bigger truths about it and how people within our government financed a lot of the terrorists and, and helped support a lot of the terrorists that made it happen. So this is the guy that created that terrorist organization. And I'm like, he needs someone to give him a stern talking to about what he did. Um, it's an hour before the event. I'm still in my pajamas. I'm still like depressed and I'm like, 
my heart started beating, and I'm like, do it or don't do it, do it or don't do it, do it or don't do it. And I'm like, I'm probably going to get there early, and I'm probably not going to make it. I'm, it's probably not going to happen. And I'm like, fuck it, let's go. And I just went, called my friend. As I'm on the train, he gives me a camera, because I didn't even have a camera back then, but I knew a friend that along the train line did have the camera. Got on the train, got there, 20 minutes late. I walk up to the ticket booth, and I'm like, is, is, it, is it still open? And the ticket receptionist was like, wow, we sold out because of you. We had one ticket remaining, um, and you are the final ticket to get into this event to hear Zbigniew Brzezinski talk. So I go into this event, and it's a huge auditorium with two levels, and it's completely dark. There's about a thousand people there, and it's you know just sloping down stage, and they have this huge grand stage, and he's on there, and he's talking, and they put me directly in the middle of the entire crowd, and I'm sitting there, and I'm like, I fomented a question that I wanted to ask him, and uh, I was either going to interrupt him at, during his talk and ask him the question or I was gonna wait to see if there's a Q&A, and then they'd announce like, yes, we're gonna be doing a Q&A with Zbigniew Brzezinski. And I'm like, okay, all right. Do it or don't do it, do it or don't do it. He finishes his talk, and they're picking on people to um, ask the questions, and I'm sitting there shaking, literally shaking, sweating, petrified of this very powerful figure that I wanted to confront, that I wanted to tell the truth to, and let him know that the people are waking up to all the illusions and lies that he's spreading. But at the same time, this is still very early on, this is still early in the 2000s, and there was a lot of fear and paranoia in the entire community. So I was pretty much thinking I was facing death if I do this, that they're gonna take me out the back, execute me, and kill me for doing this. So I was terrified, and I'm there shaking, one person goes in the front of the stage, and I and I and I like put, didn't even put my hand up. A second person goes, and I'm like, my hand goes up a little bit higher, and I'm like, no, I can't do this. No, I can't do this. I can't do this. Third question goes, and I'm like, ah, freaking out, sweating. Uh, my paper with my question is, is all like written weirdly, and I'm like, what, what do I do? What do I do? What do I do? What do, I do? And then I thought about my friend who passed away, and I'm like, if he had this opportunity, he would take it and our life is short, so we need to take all the opportunities we have in life. So I raised my hand as wide as I could, all the way down the middle, and then the moderator made the mistake of just saying, oh yeah, let's take a question right down there, right in the middle, and he picked me. Uh, so I have a camera, and they passed me the microphone, and I had my notes, but I can't hold three things together. So he like, I like stand up and I, pick up the camera and I'm shaking the camera. My notes and the question I was gonna ask fall down and I'm like, uh. <laughs> and then I was just like, screw it. And I directly asked him about all his secret society connections, about his connections to the Muhajid and, and the terrorist of 9-11 and all the darker conspiracies and all the crazy stuff that he was a part of. And, and I was like, um, you know, what do you have to say for that? And the whole crowd of a thousand people were like, oh, <laughs> and it, it felt like it was just vibrating just for their, for their reactions. And it was surreal feeling this huge fright of like, holy cow, I just pissed off this entire room and they're angry at me. Speaking of Brzezinski, he wasn't amused by the question. So he was like, um, no, we're not going to answer that question. Uh, next question. And I'm like, what? And the moderator's trying to grab the microphone away from me. And I'm like, I just, I just went through all of this for no reason, and he's not even going to answer my question? And I'm like, hell no. So I ripped the microphone back from the moderator. I was like, answer the damn question. We know what you did in Afghanistan with the Taliban. We saw you there with bin Laden and all these other people. You knew all the order Illuminati scum. <laughs> And then the whole room was like, oh! answer the goddamn question or I'm not going anywhere. Zbigniew <laughs> Brzezinski's like, 
so this big nerd presents, he's like, shut up and sit down. I'm like, no, not until you answer the question. He's like, okay, fine, I'll answer your question. I was like, I was like, oh crap, all right, good. Okay. I'm still, I'm still with my camera, and the camera is shaking as like as violently as he could. You could watch the video now; it's on YouTube. Uh, I put horrible system of a down music in between it just to make it even more cool. But as I'm there, the moderator's like, stop filming. I'm like, I'm press. I have every right to film. He's like, you're not press. I'm like, who are you to say I'm not press? I'm press. And then we start arguing, and I'm like, you're disrupting this event. You should stop being rude to people here. <laughs> He's like, oh, that's it. That's it. He went back, and I'm like, what the hell's going to happen now? I'm probably going to get executed in the back. I'm like, and I'm filming the response, and there's this sweetest old lady who's at least 80 years old sitting in front of me. And she turns around and makes direct eye contact with me because the crowd is still like, oh, <laughs> still reeling from that question. She looks me dead in the eyes and she's like, you're scum. And I'm like, holy shit, like, what did I do? I'm turning grandmas <laughs> into like cursing little villains. And then before I know it, as I'm there, I'm like, I, I couldn't say anything back to the grandma. I'm like, Grandma, you got this. Like, I'm not going to say anything back to you. And I'm still, I'm like, still trying to film the answer. But before I know it, they have these huge security guards who were working there. One of them grabbed me by the left arm. One of them grabbed me by the right arm. And then before I knew it, my feet were dangling in front of me. And I'm like, what the hell's happening here? I was like, oh, man, this is, this is definitely where I'm going to get assassinated. Uh, <laughs> like, there's no need for this. And they're literally dragging me out. And I'm thinking, holy cap, I'm probably going to die. Well, before I die, I might as well just uh, tell them one more thing. I'm like, you New World Order scumbag, <laughs> you could try to silence me, but you won't. The people will wake up of this country and find out all the horrible things you're doing. And the crowd again <laughs> erupts, utter chaos, and I'm getting dragged out. One of his being near Brzezinski's assistant starts running up, and she starts smashing the video camera, because I'm filming this, as I'm getting dragged out, screaming at the entire place on the top of my lungs, literally thinking they're going to kill me. Uh, and I'm like, fuck, what's going to happen? And then she's like, take the tape, take the tape, take his camera. They drag me outside, and, and there's like already like huge shoving matches happening. They, they have me restricted. They're trying to like take the DV tape out of my video camera, and those how, that's how like old cameras worked. They had the little tapes. If they took the tape, they took all the footage, and it never happened. And I'm literally like wrangling this camera away from this lady trying to steal my camera. I'm like, no, no, what are you doing? I'm a journalist. I have every right to do this. I, I never, you know, considered myself a journalist, but then I was like, screw it, this is my escape. I'm a journalist. And then for some reason, I was like, well, uh, I'm gonna have to get out of here somehow. So I ducked down as, as far as I could and I twisted where the two security guards hit their heads. They, and then I'm like, I have to run for it. They're gonna kill me and steal my camera. So I started running. Uh, there was police there, they started running. So I'm running, I kicked the door down, ran as fast as I could out of there, I'm like, no way, I'm not dying today. No way they're taking this video. I'm not dying until someone sees this video online on YouTube. I remember running my ass off. They were giving chase, and then after six blocks, I was finally able to outrun them, and I went left, and I went right, and I went all these different ways, and I finally got out of there, and I turned back the camera, and I'm like, ah, you got yours, being your Brzezinski. And it was one of the most surreal, one of the most amazing moments in my life. And that's when I knew there is no security in life and no security could ever stop me. And security doesn't exist. It's an illusion. And people who think they have security are only going to be fooled once again that they don't. Uh, especially people like Henry Kissinger. Henry Kissinger is also a very similar as being a Brzezinski type. I put my intentions out there. I decided to confront him. And I put my, I tried to manifest it before anything happened. And um, I meditated on it. I'm like, I'm going to confront Henry Kissinger. I didn't know how. I didn't know when. I didn't know how, when it was going to happen, where it was going to happen. But I knew it was going to happen. Uh, that same week, I get something in the mail saying, oh, we're having an event with Henry Kissinger. You should come on by. I'm like, okay. Yeah, uh, sure. <laughs> 
tried to reg register as press. They didn't accept me as press, just came in there anyway. The doors were open because the event was over. Henry Kissinger was shaking everyone's hand and I just went up to him and I'm like, um, you remember when you said military men are dumb, stupid animals to be used as pawns for foreign policy? Could you expand on that, Mr. Henry Kissinger? And he looked like he just shit a whole ton of bricks, but he thought he was safe. Everyone was there, was kissing his ass. Every there, everyone there was you know, boosting him up. And the same thing happened, you know, and then afterwards I got him again about all the genocides he did in Chile and East Timor and all over Asia and all over South America. Screamed at him again in a similar fashion. Also put the video up on YouTube. And I started putting up all these videos and then before I knew it, um, I'm sitting, I'm back in college, I'm sitting in school and then I get a text message being like, who the hell is We Are Change Ohio? I'm like, I don't know. I have no idea who We Are Change Ohio is. I've never been to Ohio. I don't know what Ohio is. And then I get on the computer, We Are Change Ohio was trending all over the world because they confronted uh, Bill Clinton and on CNN, and the whole world watched it as they screamed at Bill Clinton about the Bohemian Grove and all the other secret societies and all the other evil things that they do. And I'm like, who the hell are these people? And it was completely decentralized. And I contacted them, I'm like, you guys didn't ask permission, you guys didn't even talk to me. Uh, you guys don't even know what We Are Change is because I don't even know what We Are Change is. And I'm like, that's why I love you guys. You guys did awesome, keep it up. Um, and then chapters spurred all around the world and there was 260 chapters of We Are Change at its biggest point. And then we kept confronting people and putting the videos out there online. And then Henry Kissinger, who you know, had a second event in New York City, and then he made sure then that he had proper security. This time, Henry Kissinger made sure that um, I wasn't able to you know, be in there. I still got in there under a fake name as a journalist, got in there as a journalist. Um, they quarantined us off where they had security guards standing around all of the press. They had us in a little corner, in a little box, and um, you couldn't get out of this corner with your camera um, because Henry Kissinger hated being confronted. He changed all the security protocols so he could never be confronted again. So people can't go up to his face and ask him legitimate hard questions. So I saw that as a challenge. I went there anyway. I bought special spy glasses that had a video camera inside of, uh, inside of them. I said, yeah, sure, I won't take my camera. I'm just gonna go use the bathroom. And instead of going to the bathroom, I went directly towards Henry Kissinger and walked up to him. I'm like, hi, Henry Kissinger, we talked before. Uh, we know each other. You're getting the Freedom Award here, but you did commit mass genocide and a number of countries want you in jail for war crimes. <laughs> How does it feel being such a hypocrite? And then he like stumbles this soup as he's slurping it. Um, and there's been so many other incidences and so many other events, five freaking times. Um, that, that this has you know, happened between me and him and they just, the opportunities keep presenting themselves because I'm open to him. Uh, he keeps trying to get more security and he keeps failing. Um, a third event, he was very successful at having a lot of security where he literally had about 50, 50 guys on, in front of the stage after his talk. So no one could walk up to him. No one could confront him. No one could ask him any questions. So he gave a speech and there's a line of like 50 security guards <laughs> lined him like all around him in a huge circle. And then he of course goes and like walks by. And I'm like, I, I, I was talking to the security guard. I'm like, oh, it's my birthday. I would love a selfie with Henry Kissinger. Uh, he's like, oh, it is, yeah. I was like, he's such a great man, such a great foreign policy thinker. It would be my dream to have a picture with him. He's like, I'll see what I could do, kid. <laughs> There's a whole line of them. And I'm like, oh, Kissinger, Kissinger, it's my birthday. Can I have a selfie? And then I, I take the camera around. He, like, cra crab walks over to me. And I'm like, how does it feel being such a mass murderer and war criminal? <laughs> he's like, <sighs> Again, it's like totally pissed off, totally angry, furious, like pushes the security guard, runs out of there, and I'm like, no, that was too short. That's not even a good video. That's like a 30 second clip. I need a good video. So I'm like, I start running outside, and I'm like, where is he, where is he? All the security guards escort him to the car, couldn't get near him because of all the security guards. And with all my, with all my like big camera gear, I'm like, well, Going for a run could be a nice exercise. So I started running after the car. 
when he was in the car down the street uh, driving, and after about 30 city blocks being utterly <laughs> exhausted, <laughs> he gets out of the car. I'm like, okay, let's continue that very important conversation we had. <laughs> And then he freaks out, calls me a scumbag and a coward and uh, lashes out at me. I'm like, I'm like, there's no escaping this no matter what you do, Henry Kissinger. Uh, the fifth event was, was the best. No, the fourth event was the best. The fifth event I haven't even released because I'm just so busy. The fourth event was one of the best because um, Henry Kissinger was doing another public speaking event. I reached out as press. They responded to me like, hell no. We see all of your videos. You gave us your YouTube channel. You told us who you were. No, you cannot be at our event. If you come to our event, you will be arrested. Do not come near the premises. Do not be outside the premises. We do not want you here. I'm like, I used a fake name. He's, then Henry Kissinger's associates were helping him run the event with the organizers, and they were like, I sent a fake, e fake name out there as, as another journalist, and they're like, Luke, we're not dumb. <laughs> you did this before, we tracked your IP, we know who you are, stop it. I don't like being told what to do. Uh, so I said, fuck it, I'm just gonna go there anyway. Um, back then, um, I had a whole number of press credentials. You cover different events, and different events give you press credentials. I went to a Huffington Post event that they were organizing. And they were giving press people passes that said press and Huffington Post on them. I'm like, oh, okay, I'll just keep this around my neck. I got on a suit. I go to the event that Henry Kissinger is doing a public speech on. And literally, there's a security guard there and uh, two security guards, police outside, gates everywhere. Security is top nine. So you know, I'm like, oh, hey, how you guys doing? Walk right past them, no problem. They had cocktails, grabbed some um, grape juice, uh, had some grape juice, and I'm just you know, sitting there trying to figure out, okay, how am I going to get Henry Kissinger? This is going to be very difficult, uh, and I'm probably going to be arrested. <laughs> um, as I'm there, I'm like, you know what? It's just going to happen. It's going to manifest, it so, it manifest itself somehow, and the opportunity is going to provide itself, and um, everything's going to work out for the best. If, you know, the worst case scenario, I just have a whole bunch of grape juice, and that's not a problem at all either. Um, free grape juice. So as I'm there, one of the media guys walks up to me, and he's like, oh, oh, oh you're, you're press. And I'm like, yeah, Huffington Post. Mm -hmm. They're like, oh yeah, Henry Kissinger's finishing up with, uh, with his interviews. Come on, let me take you to the back. Let me get you right before uh, he uh, finishes his, uh, uh, his interviews and goes on stage. And I was like, okay, sure. Literally takes me like, by the hand, brings me backstage, and there's Henry Kissinger just like standing there all for me. He's like, and he, and he walks up to me, he's like, Henry Kissinger, this is uh, from Huffington Post. You should really talk to this young gentleman. I'm like, oh. I'm like, here we go again, motherfucker. Like, uh, and he, as soon as he saw me, he's like, he knew what was going to happen. And uh, it was a very interesting conversation. You could definitely watch all the videos on my uh, YouTube channel. He got very mad, uh, lashed out on me. Uh, but uh, again, shows you there's absolutely no security. And no matter what you try to do to secure yourself, there's going to be buttholes like me that are going to find a pesky way to get in there, confront you, especially if you're doing something evil. So my last words for the cryptocurrency community and all of you guys, embrace the unsecurity. Embrace the kind of fight or flight moment. Embrace the moment where you don't know what's happening, but keep your intentions good. And if people are doing something bad, call them out. Uh, so that's it. Yeah. That's hell of an answer for a question how to be an independent individual for the 21st century. Uh, stay safe out there, guys, when you're listening to Luke Ratkowski. One more round of applause for him. Thank you. And now we're asking both of our special guests today to take the stage, to sit comfortably and to discuss with us broadly how we can be crypto entrepreneurs, self-sovereign individuals, 
this is a special type of event that we're having here. So we started with people from governments talking about how technology can be applied in, in our life as a citizens, as a part of the society, but we're finishing it with those two. Uh, who are telling us that, well, maybe there is an alternative and maybe we should reconsider a few things, taking a, a step back or, or a few steps back, uh, looking at, at, at how we are really interacting with the system and how, what is our position within it. Um, my question to, to start this, this open format, uh, because now that the microphone will go to the audience and we would just like to talk to Jeff and, and look and get even more inspired. But um, your, your recipes for, for the success or for staying independent are, are really uh, extreme for, let's say, people looking from outside. But it's, it's chaos. Yeah, chaos can be beautiful. And, uh, but definitely keeps you and keeps other aligned with uh, people somewhere in the mi minority. It's not convenient to live like this. So my question is, how do you guys feel about being constantly in minority? And, uh, and are there any prospects to, to become majority, to have this really paradigm shift in people's heads not really looking at crypto and decentralization as a way to get get rich quick quick but to somehow rework our approach to life and our approach to to being to interacting with all those public or systemic sectors um do you want to take this first or should i um, I think one of the reasons me and Jeff get along so well is because we dealt with uh, depression a lot. I dealt with a lot of depression. You dealt with a lot of depression as well. And it's a, it's a very big overcoming, horrible, uh, low feeling. But when you come out of it, you come out of it wide-eyed and you want to do so many amazing things and you want to take advantage of all the opportunities that are not there uh, because you wasted so much time just being so hard on yourself. And that's when, when you're free, you go crazy. And that's why we go to Somalia and Venezuela and Zimbabwe and go all throughout these crazy countries and risk our lives and do all these other crazy things because we're kind of com coming from the same kind of um, kind of energy, the same kind of field. Uh, being a part of the minority, to answer that question specifically, is not a bad thing. Uh, throughout history, the minority has pretty much been right a lot of the times, and the majority has been leading people down astray into a very bad, horrible paths. Uh, you can look at the rise of nationalism and the rise of a lot of extremist views. A lot of those were done uh, because of government and because of the mass population saying, government, do this. The real power is decentralization. It's not having a mass. It's about being all individuals and all taking part in something that is better and greater uh, of a good than uh, just your own personal interests. And that's something that I truly believe in. And uh, even though we're two crazy guys who do things that random people don't usually do, we're part of a process, and you guys are a part of a bigger process that all conjoin together and work together cohesively uh, towards our vision of a better world. Yeah, it's, excuse me. Um, I'm, I'm just, I've been part of the minority so long that I don't know what it's like not to be. So it's, it's a very comfortable <laughs> place. Uh, even when I was in the government indoctrination camps as a kid, I was maybe 13 years old and I told my mom, I said, this is, a, this is prison for kids. <laughs> uh, they're, they're not teaching me anything I will ever use in my life. I have to sit there for eight hours and ask permission to go to the washroom. And I was like, this is BS. Um, so from a very early age, I, was, I just recognized what was actually going on. And I think the reason that most people don't recognize a lot of what's going on is because many of these systems are set up in place to uh, indoctrinate people, to enslave them uh, without them even knowing it. So m many people think, you know, having the government run the schools, well, that's, that's the way it should be. Uh, just because it's been that way for a number of decades now. And, of course, in those school systems, what is one of the things that they don't teach the kids? How to think. 
<laughs> That's the only thing that I could think of as a good reason to go to a school is to learn how to think, but they don't teach them that, and that's on purpose because they don't want your average person to actually know how to think. They want them to memorize mostly false or wrong or evil dates and, and times and, and capitals of states and who's the president and, and do their Pledge of Allegiance every day. And they go home and they turn on the television programming and that's another uh, form of actually hypnosis. It's actually literally hypnosis um, th through various forms. It's literally brainwashing. And I guess one thing about per me as um, growing up, I didn't spend a lot of time watching television because uh, I was a computer nerd. So from the time I was 10 years old, I was just on computers all the time. So I guess maybe that's why I thought differently is I, I, I wasn't that programmed and I, I barely went to school. I actually worked out a deal with the, the principal at one point because I figured out ways that uh, I could not go to school. And my mom, uh, they called at one point. They said, you know, he hasn't been here for like a month. And she came down to my room. She's like, you haven't been going to school? I'm like, no, I told you it's a complete waste of time. And uh, she's like, you have to go. You have to get your badge of obedience, your, your diploma, which I've never, ever used my entire life. And no one's ever asked. Uh, so at one point, I actually, she'd come down, and she'd, she'd make sure I was up at, out of bed at like 7 in the morning. So horrible. And living in northern Canada, it's pitch black. It's minus 40 out, 7, neat, neat, the alarm goes off. Got to go to the indoctrination camps. And, and she'd come down. And so I'd, I'd actually get up, and I'd take my shoes, and I'd go, and I'd sleep in my closet. And so she'd come down, look in. Oh, good, he's gone. He must have went to school. I'd be sleeping in the closet. Eventually, they, they, they found out about that more. And I, I just said, listen, let me just go for the test. This is a complete waste of time. You guys are all idiots. Like <laughs> all my teachers, I'm like, you guys are morons. How are you going to teach me anything? Uh, and um, they, they actually allowed me just to go for the test. And I actually, on purpose, tried to get 50% on every test because I knew that was the number I needed to get my, my badge of obedience. Um, so yeah, I'm just used to being in, in the minority. I think we we do have the opportunity now through technology, through things like blockchain, to actually make it so I'm not the minority anymore, uh, all without people even knowing. We could actually go to a completely free world in the next 10 years. All of a sudden, if everyone in the world starts using cryptocurrency, that is possible, and probably take about 10 years before that really catches on to a, a large extent, uh, we'd see the collapse of central banks. That would see the end of most poverty in the world and the end of wars, and we'd have a much more peaceful and prosperous world. Uh, and then the governments wouldn't have as much money to do all the things that they do. Uh, and very quickly, these things could just fade away, just like a bad nightmare. Uh, and it's all, and people might not even really realize what happened. Uh, your average person doesn't need to know why these things are happening. Uh, they don't need to understand the philosophy or the technology of what's going on. Uh, we just need to create new systems that just make the old systems obsolete. And that's what we're doing with blockchain technology. Um, I think that answers the question. So we're going to be taking questions, so we're going to have someone with a mic, so just raise your hand if you want to ask some questions. But continuing that conversation before we find somebody, once you wake up, it's impossible not to want to tell someone about it, especially about the financial system and how it's run and how it's screwing people out of their wealth and robbing them. Once you're seeing such a horrible crime happen, that trap laid out for people, you want to prevent them from falling into that trap. And the financial system is one of the biggest traps out there that screws people over. So is education, so is medicine, so is almost virtually uh, the press, the media, all of it. It's all 180 degrees flipped upside down. Question? Uh, yeah, quick question. As you were saying, we're building a new system to make the other system obsolete. What are your takes that big companies like Amazon, Google, or anybody like that are going to be first to that, to that race? Or is, what's your take on that? How do you, how, how do you avoid that? Well, they're going to do it uh, anyway. Facebook uh, has uh, said they've been working in secret uh, blockchain uh, plans for, for, I think, six months now or a year. You know, there's nothing we can do to stop them from doing that. In fact, if they start to move to their, let's say Facebook makes their own cryptocurrency, which makes total sense. And let's say everyone starts using it because everyone's on Facebook. That will just advance the cryptocurrency space massively because all of a sudden people will start to be using a cryptocurrency. It won't be the best one. It'll be a Facebook, FBI book, CIA book, uh, cryptocurrency. Uh, but they'll now be used to using cryptocurrencies. And then it'll all just take people like us going on the side and going, 
you know, you should trade that FBI book coin for something actually <laughs> good. Uh, and here's how easy it is. And, and so we don't really want to stop them and we can't stop them from, from doing these things. And we will see most nations in the world will move towards a cryptocurrency of a form, but it won't be a decentralized crypto. It'll be one that they control. It'll be essentially digitizing fiat currency. Um, and many people say that that's very bad. I, I think it's actually kind of good because it will move people towards getting used to using cryptocurrencies. And once you're out of the fiat banking system and the fiat currency system and you're into a digital currency, even if it is a bad one, like a government controlled, centralized, uh, heavily inflated, uh, manipulated currency, which is what they, that's what central banks do. They only have two things they do. They counterfeit money, create more money, and they manipulate markets, uh, interest rates. So they'll continue to do that in a digital form, uh, but that will just make more people get used to using digital currencies and cryptocurrencies, and it will actually make the transition a lot easier for us in the end. But yes, the, the race always is. You can use technology in any way you want. You can use it for good or for bad. The good to me is allowing people to have uh, true freedom uh, and a, a true money that actually is a s sound money that can't be inflated by a bunch of people in a boardroom with Janet Yellen or Ben Bernanke or whatever criminals there now, uh, and they decide how much to print. That's, that's actually very Soviet-style central planning. Actually, uh, central banking is a tenet of communism. So it's essentially communism of the money system. But as, as so you can use it for, for, for bad, and that's what the governments are going to do, and, and probably uh, things like Facebook and things like that. And f as Luke knows, Facebook and Google, that's, it's basically all part of the, the CIA. Um, uh, but we'll create all the other options, alternatives out there, and we'll allow people to choose what they want. They can choose to continue in slavery, but for the first time ever, they're going to have the option not to. This is where me and Jeff disagree sometimes and have arguments, uh, because if you're in the cryptocurrency space, do not use Amazon. If you care about free civilization and uh, not having a technocratic state, do not use Amazon. It is the biggest fear that I have with them being not only so powerful as they are right now, Jeff Bezos is the richest man in the entire world. Um, and look at what they're doing. Uh, they're working at quantum computing, artificial intelligence. They're working with police departments to help crack uh, algorithms to help local police departments find people who are using cryptocurrencies. Uh, they are working with the Pentagon. They are working with the CIA. They are selling high-level AI facial recognition technology uh, to local police departments all across the United States, and they are not a private corporation. They are a branch of the government. They get so many tax incentives. They get so many grants. They got so much government money. They were given so many different passes, and now they are going to become one of the most powerful corporations out there with already the world's most powerful man who also owns a newspaper, has contracts with the CIA and Pentagon, and is working on technology that will be able to break cryptocurrency. And at the same time, have a machine that will be far more superior and intelligent than us. Uh, to me, this is one of the biggest concerns out there. Do not, do not use Amazon. Uh, you are financing the beast, uh, and you, we're not gonna have a good time because of them. But I do love ordering stuff and getting it the next day, and it's so cool. Um, but I do agree, and, and in some forms, and definitely, as people, we need to make the choice on what we're going to put our energy and our time into. And so there is now uh, social, uh, sorry, blockchain-based social media networks, uh, things like Steemit.com. If you guys don't know about Steemit, you really should. I've been talking about it for a number of years. Um, it's, and we're going to have numerous other blockchain-based social media networks. So absolutely, and I post all my stuff first on Steemit. I still post on Facebook because a lot of people are on there. Uh, but you know, it's really up to us. We really do, for the first time, have the option to, to choose to continue to support these systems or not. And we have the option for the first time to, to, to actually get away from these sort of systems. So it's going to be very interesting. They're going to, yeah, they're going to fight it as, as hard as they possibly can. Uh, they're going to try to crack uh, cri the cryptocurrencies uh, using quantum computing and things like that. But of course, there's ways that we can improve the technology so that it'll, it'll always step, stay one step ahead of them. But this, will, this is an ongoing battle that will continue on for many, many years for sure. We have a question down here and then up above there. Will you stop buying things on Amazon? 
Son of a bitch. I'll ask you an easier question. Um, both of you guys have done a really impressive job creating a platform to educate and further the messages that you speak to. I think part of it is because it's ideas whose time has come, but also the communication medium that you've chosen um, being YouTube. So over the last uh, few years, we've seen YouTube acting more and more strange, doing nefarious things behind the scenes to suppress views, shadow bans, outright bans. Um, aside from Steam, what are some other communication mediums that you're looking to move to to uh, continue to grow the message? Well, um, one that's based on the Steam blockchain as well is DTube. So um, it's, a, it's a more blockchain-based uh, video uh, thing. There's a number of them coming out right now. That's what I was saying in my talk is we have yet to see all the innovations that are going to be coming out. We're very early in this. We will see everything go blockchain-based in the next couple of years. Um, and as the technology improves as well, and as we figure out ways, and that's why I think EOS is quite important, is it's figuring out ways to do millions of transactions per second. You can't have a, a site like Facebook or YouTube that's based on a blockchain that has a 10-minute block time uh, and can process one megabyte of data every 10 minutes. Uh, it's kind of crazy to think that Bitcoin still runs on a floppy disk. Uh, that's uh, one, or it's, I guess it's two megabytes now. Um, but, and you know, not to say I'm a pro on, on the tech and I, you know, I really don't know what the best way is, but I think we'll see lots of different options. And there's many, there's, there's so many, even on, based on Bitcoin Cash, there's a Twitter based on Bitcoin Cash. I forget what that one's called. Does anyone know the name of that one? Anyway, it's uh, something on Twitter like. So all these things are being ported over to blockchain uh, based systems. And we're going to continue to see that. Uh, Steam only started about, I think it's two years ago. And uh, it really hasn't improved all that much. They've been very slow on, on developing it. But there's other people. There's, there's busy.org now that I think does a better job from what I've seen. And uh, numerous people work on different things. But we haven't really had the blockchain tech to build out really cool stuff um, like that because of the, the, the block uh, uh, size issues and, and things like that. And now we're starting to see things like EOS and different other alternatives where we can have uh, faster transactions and free transactions. Uh, and then we can, we'll, we'll see so much innovation built on top of that. And really, people out there uh, are um, looking for things to do. There's, there's no end to things to possibly do out there. Like, really, just look at the world, look what exists today, and figure out how, and if, it, it, you know, not everything needs to be on a blockchain, obviously, but how that could possibly be ported over to some sort of blockchain-based technology. Uh, we, you'll see some absolute massive things coming online in the next few years, and that's that's really where the future is. So, someone out there, I know there's numerous like library working on because the big issue with video is the massive file sizes. So you can't really have that on a blockchain, so to speak. Well, I guess you could, but uh, the, those are mainly the issues: is the size of these files and things like that. Um, but I think over time, and as things get developed, things like EOS and and others and people create new things, we'll have more opportunities and more options. Yeah, you, you know there's overstock.com that actually accepts cryptocurrency that you could buy probably all your supplements and pills and dietary supplements all on there while supporting a good company and voting with your dollar, which I think is extremely important for everyone to realize and translates into this question. Um, we were one of the first, if not one of the first channels on YouTube to get demonetized, so obviously we've been getting hit extremely hard. There's BitChute, there's DTube, DLive, Steemit, there's so many other platforms, but sadly, if you still want to make an impact and still want to make a difference, you have to use uh, the Luciferian technology that's out there and the companies. Uh, technocratic corporations to get your message out. Hopefully that thing will, you know, will change, but I think we need, you know, multiple approaches uh, being available on multiple platforms, trying to reach the general mass out there as much as possible. And not only voting with your dollar by going to overstock.com instead of Amazon, but also voting with your attention, your clicks, your likes and shares, which are more important than ever since these mega technocrats want to make sure that people don't hear the messages that we want to get out there. Not only to people like me that question the status quo, but also a lot of cryptocurrency people as well that are being blocked on there, uh, even prevented from advertising on some of these major platforms, which has a big impact on everything. Next question. Go ahead. Yeah, speak up. Is it, is it it? Okay, perfect. So uh, thank you for sharing uh, your stories and all what you've been doing. 
to help this movement moving forward. And uh, I would try and uh, distinguish technology with the uh, politics and movements that we're trying to push. Uh, I believe that uh, blockchain and DLT is mostly based on transparency and immutability and auditability. So that, that's what empowers transparency. And uh, if we are libert libertarian, so we want to be free and we want to push towards freedom, we need to see the part of privacy and anonymity that can be brought into this technology. And if we look at what, what has happened over the past 12 months or so, there have been a huge push towards some kind of know your custom in the blockchain uh, uh, industry. And this is actually taking back some of the freedom that some have perceived in the uh, blockchain movement. In the sense that if you look at the amount of money that was being invested by anonymous contributors over the last 12 months or so, now this, uh, this number is decreasing because they need to disclaim, to disclose who they are. So there is, I think, the, the corporates, the governments are trying to eat part of the cake that came with the blockchain. We are saying it. And um, I would think we should uh, try and push the real privacy which the uh, blockchain can bring. And a way of doing that, because at Pillar Project, what we're doing is to give control back to users onto their personal data because we know that their situations, they might want to be public, having some KYC thing. There are situations where they would like to be absolutely, uh, absolutely private. And we need to bring these two things together in the technology so that at a time when the corrupt system you're talking about fails, they should be able then to power the privacy uh, capabilities. Yeah, privacy, of course, is incredibly important in our world today when we have mafias all over the world called governments that are extorting uh, people, they call it taxation, uh, for trillions and trillions of dollars per year. Um, privacy actually isn't all that important if we don't have a world with governments. Uh, for me personally, I don't mind if Facebook knows what stuff I'm looking at and gives me some good advertisements that match with what I want to buy and things like that. The issue is when you have governments out there, we need privacy and uh, for that reason, I'm a huge supporter of any sort of privacy-related things on the blockchain. I've been a really big supporter of Monero. Um, I've also been, a, to some extent, a supporter of things like Zcash um, uh, and other ones that are that are very privacy-focused. And yeah, we, we really need that. And really, for the the developers out there, there's two there's two different ro roads this can go. And, and you can have a thing like the consensus conference in New York, which is all banks and politicians and governments all figuring out how they can use this technology to continue to extort and rob and destroy the the world, uh, while we create the, the, the privacy technology to allow people to still remain free. But yes, the, the whole KYC thing is absolutely massive. I actually have been trying to do an ICO, which would be a dollar vigilante, sort of a mix between a hedge fund and a, a uh, venture capital fund, which would just be based on a token. And really, when we started to look at it, um, all of a sudden, we started to realize that I'd probably be in Guantanamo Bay unless we did numerous certain things and it, it really hurts me to have to adhere to these regulations. But for my own personal safety, um, if I don't want to end up in Guantanamo Bay just for making a coin on the internet, uh, we have to adhere to those regulations. That's why it's also super important that we get to more decentralized more quickly to the point where we have decentralized exchanges because that's really where they get the KYC, the know your clients and make you fill out all the forms and the anti-money laundering stuff. Uh, money laundering is, is um, not a crime. It's absolutely a beautiful thing. I wish everyone would money launder in the entire world and we'd have a much better world. Uh, but they get you at the exchange level. So for your average person in the US, for example, and they want to buy some crypto, they're probably going to go to Coinbase, which is just almost the same as going down to your local 
a branch of Wells Fargo, giving them all your documents and all your government identification and your fingerprints or whatever else they want. But we need to get to the point where we have decentralized exchanges. That they, that's the whole point. That's, that's why Bitcoin became so popular, because you can't shut it down. Uh, if there was a Bitcoin CEO, he'd already be in jail or killed. Um, if there was a Bitcoin office, there'd already be a SWAT team in there uh, just taking everything. Uh, but because there isn't, they can't stop it. So now that they're trying to figure out ways that they can try to keep it under control and, and keep people in this enslavement system, uh, even if they're into cryptos. But that's why there's so many people out there working on privacy-related things, and of course, Pillar's uh, part of that, and, and Monero, and many others. And it's really important to recognize that this is a much bigger issue than, uh, this is a massive issue. If we don't get to a world where we have crypto that is private, that is untrackable, untraceable, uh, unseizable, uh, that anyone can have access to, uh, we will have complete and total human slavery even worse than we have today. It'll be even worse because they'll be able to track every single transaction with government digital currencies. Every single transaction you do, and that could be just me sending $10 to Luke of uh, using the government crypto, it'll have a tax already on it and it'll already be gone and there'll be nothing I can do to stop it as long as I'm using those currencies. So. It's really a race to who can uh, get there the fastest, and it's going to just be an ongoing battle for the next um, probably decades. Um, it might be over sooner than that. If we win, if, if our side wins, uh, we will have a, a world of peace and prosperity like no one could ever imagine. We'll get rid of central banks, get rid of all the extortion, uh, almost all poverty in the world will just disappear. Um, if they win, we will have a complete uh, world of total subjugation and slavery that you won't even be able to get outside of. You, a person like me, once we get to the, if we get to the point where everyone's using government cryptos and there's no other options, a person like me, they'll just turn off my, my crypto card. Uh, they'll just say, nope, <laughs> we don't like what Jeff and, and Luke are doing, so they can't buy things anymore. Uh, not just even at Amazon, but anywhere, anything, anywhere won't be able to do that. So that's what they want to get to. That's what they're working on at places like Bilderberg. And that's why they've got, it's all technology focused now. I didn't go this year, Luke went again. But it's Peter Thiel and uh, Eric Schmidt, and uh, Eric Schmidt from Google, he spends more time at the White House than at the Google offices, I think. So uh, th that's what they're working on, and people should be aware of that, and, and hopefully more people like Luke stand up and, and call them out, and don't even let these people walk down the street without at least having a few oranges or apples thrown at them, at, at the very least. Uh, definitely not shaking their hands and treating them like they're, they're great people. Uh, but yeah, that's where it's going, and, and that's why privacy is so incredibly important. And, and this is a battle that'll be going on for a number of years. And you know, in, in, we, we're winning at the moment. Uh, they kind of slowed it down with what happened with Bitcoin last year. Uh, but this is going to be an ongoing battle. But people should, out there should realize this is what it's all about. We're not talking about making money here. We're not talking about just making it a little easier for you to buy a product on the internet. We're talking about it's either going to be complete human slavery and subjugation for eternity, the boot stamping on the human face, as George Orwell said, for eternity, or complete peace and prosperity on earth like we've never known it if we can, uh, if the freedom side wins out. So it's a massive, massive, incredibly important uh, thing uh, that we're all working on right now and it's an ongoing battle. Ditto, money laundering is great. Next question. <laughs> right, right, right over there. Uh, I think it, there is a like, um, I thought it would be like interesting competition, which country will develop uh, contactless uh, crypto? Um, kind of uh, where you can able to use the phone or uh, which country will develop official uh, currency as a crypto? So what do you think about this kind of competition? Well, if a government does it, you could bet your bottom dollar it's going to be used against the interests of the people. Venezuela um, is you know, developing with one, is working with one, and uh, the Venezuelan government is one of the worst governments that me and Jeff experienced firsthand. It's ridiculous what's happening in that country that is very beautiful, prosperous with natural resources, but the leadership and also U.S. intervention on some levels and interfering has caused that country to just be 
the worst place and the murder capital of the entire world. Uh, so when we were there, we just saw so many ridiculous things. Every single business had to had a huge wall of permits and permissions and licenses to operate a hot dog stand uh, or you know a bodega or a corner store or whatever you may you know think. Huge, huge wall in uh, in the entire building. Uh, one wall full of permits, another wall, a big no smoking sign, and a, and the third wall, uh, no guns allowed here. And then the, the fourth wall had actually the business and the information about the business. Uh, but it just shows you they have you know people going around there being like, yeah, make sure people don't smoke here on this area. Make sure you have all of your 50 permits and permissions. Make sure that uh, no one here has a security guard with a gun in the number one murder capital of the world where police at night tell you to drive during red lights because it's more dangerous for you to uh, stop uh, in the middle of the night uh, where, you know, Jeff was smoking a cigarette outside of the hotel. The guy runs up, panics, and is like, uh, I'm so sorry, you can't smoke here, but uh, don't go outside there. You'll be robbed immediately or murdered. <laughs> like, like, this is the place. And imagine uh, a government having a cryptocurrency. Venezuela is trying to do it uh, based on the oil and the amount of power and capabilities they would have when they see virtually everything in and out and have the ability to tax it automatically with uh, the special interest rate. So it is a total Orwellian control uh, because the only way the people of Venezuela have been able to survive is because of the black market of people going out there transferring foreign currency uh, for their currency. And that's one of the few ways that they're actually able to actually get some food down, uh, down there, some resources down there, some medicine down there. So so people don't die and already they're dying in incredible numbers and it's just a travesty what's happening down there. All right, next question. Go ahead. One second. I'll, I'll try and make this brief because I'm still trying to formulate the question. Um, okay, so I gather most people in the crypto space don't like central banks. Uh, they don't like the fact that there's a government that controls things and inflating your money away in terms of, you know, it becomes valueless over time. So how do you deal with the problem of uh, deflation, in, which is like inevitable with almost every crypto which has a limited supply? So if you have deflation, then there's no incentive to invest or to, uh, to lend. So for example, why would you get a mortgage? Or why would anyone lend money to someone else for a mortgage when actually probably uh, over time, the, the property will actually decrease in value well, let's say on Bitcoin on, on a Bitcoin basis because the value of Bitcoin rises. So without an incentive to spend your money, unless you have to do it, of course, like for basic necessities, how do you do, how do you deal with that? It's interesting that a lot of people worry a lot about deflation. We've basically had inflation for all of human history. As long as there's been government-controlled uh, fiat currencies, uh, definitely since 1913 with the founding of the Federal Reserve. With them taking the gold backing completely away from it in 1971, uh, that uh, we've had nothing but inflation. And it's funny, some people talk about deflation. We've never had deflation. So it's really interesting. We don't know how the economy and how the world will react if we do have deflation. All we've ever known is inflation. Everyone knows that if you have some money, you leave it in a bank account for 10 years, it's going to buy a lot less in 10 years from now. That's inflation. What's interesting is I don't really know, and I think a lot of monetary scientists and a lot of uh, Austrian economics people are trying to figure out what exactly will happen if we have actual deflation. What we know is that, yes, uh, in general, if you have deflation, the value of the currency is going to rise over time. Now, how that affects the economy, that's really, we don't really know. We've never really had that before, as far as I know. Um, one thing we know is that generally, if you want to save money, you just hold your crypto and it will generally probably go up over time as long as it continues to have adoption and continues to be used. This is very interesting because one of the most important things to a society and an economy is savings. That's called capital. That's where the word capitalism comes from. Uh, and capitalism isn't what most people think it is. It basically just means saving and investing in, in, in a private free market. Um, so we don't know what's going to happen. There, there definitely could definitely be some issues. I don't know exactly what's going to happen, but I'd rather actually, if you had to pick one, the, the best money is one that doesn't inflate or deflate. It, it stays the same amount of uh, 
in circulation, it just stays that way. So it's, it's always very sound and you know that there's not going to be more, there's not going to be less of it and they don't have to worry about what's going to happen with prices because of that. So we'll see what happens with uh, these currencies. And of course, a lot of these currencies can change as well, right? So what could happen is down the road, we could start to realize that it's actually becoming a bit of an issue, that the deflation and what could happen is some people will say, well, let's change the, uh, the way the, the currency works a little bit so that there isn't deflation. Let's keep it issuing at a certain amount uh, so that there isn't. But if I had to choose inflation or deflation, if I had to pick one, I would definitely pick deflation. Uh, inflation is one of the most nefarious ways of robbing everyone in society is by having having the value of the money constantly going down. By doing that, you can't save as much. When you can't save as much, you can't invest as much, which means there's less innovation, there's less new businesses, there's less things in the economy. Deflation is, is, a, is, is more of an unknown. Um, we'll see what happens, but it definitely could become an issue. I, don't, I personally don't know what will happen, and I don't think anyone really knows. But uh, as I said, if, if I had to pick one, I'd pick deflation because when you have deflation, to some extent, people don't need to even have a, such a thing as a bank account. They don't need to really be investing in things like treasury bonds, which is investing in, in the war machine of the U.S. government. They can just hold on to their currency and it, 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 it gains in value over time. Uh, that's, a, that's a very good thing. Um, you know, there's the, the meme on the internet about what a Bitcoin buys you in groceries. Uh, eight years ago, it bought you um, like a, something small and now it's like it buys you a Lambo almost, you know, it, that sort of a thing. That's, that also could be bad. But, um, you know, I think the market's just going to have to see how these all play out. Um, you know, the deflation in Bitcoin isn't that small. In fact, it's inflating, right? So there's still money being, there's Bitcoin being created. It won't stop being created until over 100 years from now. The deflation argument comes in about the amount that gets lost and people just uh, lose access to their keys and stuff like that. Uh, but that's something that the market's just going to have to figure out. But as I said, I'd, I'd much prefer we have cryptos that might be slightly deflationary than central bank communist style centrally planning of the economy with massive extortion rackets and massive wars. You know, I think if I had to choose one, I think I'd choose the uh, crypto that has some deflation. Uh, you want a question? Whatever you guys want to do. Um, well, I mean, I, I think, you know, with Bitcoin, for example, I mean, it's, it's the easiest example. Uh, it's, the supply is inflating, but the no, as the number of users increase, of course, the number of Bitcoins per person decreases uh, in, in terms of like a user base. But let's ignore that because, you know, you can ju pick a different crypto or you, you know, you, you adjust the algorithm or something. Um, if you have a system that uh, does not inflate, or rather you have no inflation, I think it's kind of obvious that you don't have an incentive to invest in anything. So let's say you've got a whole bunch of Bitcoin right now, and everything you buy is priced in Bitcoin, but you know that whatever you buy now will be worth less later. There is absolutely no incentive to invest. Like for example, why would you buy a house? Why would you invest in a company? Unless that company is going to generate way, way more money, which it won't because the supply is not large enough. I mean, unless you have a crypto that inflates, no? Yeah, you could be right. Uh, we're going to see how these things play out in real life. You never really know until the market, but you know, as long as, like what would the deflation rate of, as I said, Bitcoin's going to be inflating for the next 100 years. You're saying that as more people use it, but that, that doesn't really matter. The, the important thing about money is that you have a, a, a constant uh, amount of it. Uh, well, what, what, what so we're so uh, Bitcoin still has inflation. population growth as well. I mean, maybe population won't grow, but if population were to grow, but, then but the important thing about a money is that it always has a certain amount. That's why gold and silver were such useful forms of money for many centuries because you couldn't inflate the amount of gold dramatically. The only way you would do that is with some massive new discovery, and that did happen actually in the silver market a few times. But the really important thing about money is that you just know that it's not going to be inflated into nothing. And that's really what causes most of the problems in the world. Most of the poverty is that well, it gets inflated into nothing. That's, I mean, I think there is an argument that says inflation could be good. For, for example, if you're highly indebted, then inflation will actually decrease your debt. It'll get you out of it. So, I mean, like the United States would probably be very happy to, uh, to inflate their money away. 
Yeah, of um, course, some people are always going to benefit from certain things. But as a whole, if you want a decent sound money, what you want is that money not to change dramatically in well, supply. Okay. I mean, I get that. If you are, I mean, the, I guess the majority of, what do you call it, middle class people are people with a bit of savings. But if you're really poor, you have no money to deflate away anyway. And if you're really rich, then your, your assets are in something like real estate or, or, or st stocks, which are essentially inflation proof. Right. That's why the inflationary system really benefits the rich. And that's what we're seeing. We're seeing the entire middle class of the U.S. just disappear now because of the way the system is set up, uh, where the super rich can invest in all these sort of things, which are fairly inflation proof. They will just continue to rise in value like real estate or, or business or whatever it is, while your average person has no savings and they're just earning less every week. It's a really heinous sort of system. So uh, I think we should probably move on to some yeah, other okay, questions. Sure. Yeah. Thank you for your time. Yeah, hi. So, uh, yeah. Um, first of all, I just really want to thank you guys, right? Whether we all agree with you or not, it's true heroism to speak out that way. So just thank you really from all of us for what you do. So my question is about that. Um, you know, in one of, um, one of the talks I gave today, uh, this week, somebody said, you know, you really probably shouldn't say that. So what is it that protects you and other people like us in this room who speak out about how we see decentralization evolving, how we see governance evolving, and how we see money evolving? What do you think has protected you guys so far so that you're actually free to travel? And what are other things that people like us in this room should be doing and looking at to keep ourselves free? Uh, Luca, I'm sure, has a bunch of things. I'll just mention really briefly that... Other than uh, running really fast. What? Oh, uh, <laughs> yeah. yeah. But actually, the, the main uh, way of control of these systems, of the, the, you know, these very uh, go large government systems, is through fear. And they want everyone to be in fear. And I don't know how life works exactly, but I have no fear, and nothing ever really happens to me. Uh, I think people create a lot of their own problems. Uh, and Luke probably has some views on that. But, but really, I just don't worry about them. I, I look at them as they are criminals and I'm going to do something else that's you know, not with them, and I don't worry about them. And if they come and do something to me, what's it going to do anyway? It's just going to actually probably get my message out there further. If someone finds out I'm in Guantanamo Bay, there's gonna be a lot of people on the internet talking about it. Oh, wh wh why did they put him there? What's he believe? And they're gonna look into what I believe, and it's gonna spread my message even f further. And they know that. Uh, so that's why they want everyone to be in fear. So for me personally, I would just suggest, of course, be smart. Uh, use privacy-related things as much as possible, but really don't worry too much. There, there's seven billion of us, and there's only really, there's not many of them. Like, really, at the top, it's a few hundred, really. And then they've got all their order followers and all the people who actually go out and commit the actual crimes on their behalf. But really, uh, not to worry about it too much, and just to, to think of it in a way that, yes, they're criminals, um, but I'm not going to change the way I live because of them, and don't worry about it. And for, you know, both Luke and I, we've been through so many crazy things and we're all in one piece, you know. It's it's almost like, I don't know, maybe you got some thoughts on that. We're just dumb and lucky. <laughs> <laughs> like we, were, we were drunk a couple nights ago and, and, and Jeff is like, you know, I could trust you because you're really dumb. And I'm like, I could trust you too because you're just dumb as me. <laughs> I was like, that's why we're best friends, man. No, but there is a, there's just something to say about go of fear, following your life path, and not being afraid to do it. That brings you during a, to a certain current in the whole life that is a big river that just puts you into a connection that protects you ultimately. Like, there's been a number of times where I almost lost my life. I had, you know, police and homeland security, uh, you know, clock their gun uh, to my head. Uh, I had, uh, you know, death threats. I it went through so many crazy situations, too many to even mention now. So just for the sake of that, uh, it always happened for a very specific reason. And I always came out of it better. 
Um, so any kind of adversity that happens to you, it's always an opportunity when you see it in the right way. And once you're on that path and once you start being in that positive cycle loop, you start reinforcing that and more greater amazing things start, start to happen to you. And that's how we're just able to, you know, everything happens. I started thinking about Pillar. Someone talks to me about it four weeks ago. Bam, I'm here. And I just realized it as soon as I got here uh, to the castle last night. So uh, all these beautiful, amazing things happen and open up to you uh, once you put yourself on that path and understand that, it's, that you're not alone. Uh, Decentralization is about everyone taking action, and the mo more of us that do, the more safer all of us are. Next question over there. Question here from the live stream. Uh, can we make trustless governance? Trustless governments? Um, that's a very deep philosophical question. Uh, can we make governments that you don't have to trust? Um, I think... Governance. 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 Trustless governance. I guess, I guess laws without, um, without a central control that we all agree on and trust. I think that's already the majority of our life. If you look at life and you look at people building communities together and coming together and working out their differences with their neighbors, that's an aspect of that. It's all, it, we're pretty much living with anarchy with a few people convincing us that they're in control and that they're in power. When, when in reality, uh, they are absolutely not. Uh, they want to act uh, with a lot of authority, but once the people decide to take it away, they don't have any. Um, so they have, you know, their little government agents that they send out there. But a lot of the problems are dealt with people individually, one on one with each other. Uh, the government's there with this kind of illusion, but that illusion could be gone at any moment at any time. And I think that's what I'm towards to, and that's what would ultimately help build um, a kind of trustless governance. I guess this is somewhat of a, a follow-up, but um, generally speaking, uh, change, even for the right intentions, can be very dangerous and very destructive. You walk around most countries today, and there's relative, it's not perfect, but there's relative peace, relative prosperity. Things generally work. Um, is there a single example of a completely decentralized, scalable um, uh, society that's, that's worked? Um. Yeah, so the question about, you know, we've never really had true anarchy before, what will be just chaos? <clears throat> a lot of people assume that I want to just have a button and just press it and all the governments and all the central banks just disappear. It's not going to happen that way. Things are going to happen gradually. What will happen is if people out there start using more cryptocurrencies and things like that, the central banks will lose a lot of power. The wars will go away a lot more. The governments won't be as big as pe as the governments get smaller, people will start to realize, hey, this is even better. Why don't we make it even smaller? And then over time, that might happen, especially as if people like ourselves are really pushing it and, and, and you know, trying to wake as many people up as possible. It's not going to be an overnight sort of a thing. A lot of people, I do the dollar vigilante, and a lot of people say, well, you know, what day is the dollar going to collapse? It's like, it's been collapsing since 1913. Uh, it's a ongoing process. Um, these things aren't um, overnight sort of processes. And... Uh, I think, as I said earlier, I think if people wake up enough, and it's all about consciousness right now, and people waking up to what's going on, and you know, at least to a small amount, as that happens, things will just change uh, over time, uh, and it doesn't have to be all crazy. Uh, it can be very just, you know, get governments just get smaller and smaller until eventually people go, why do we even need them at all? And they just eventually just close the door and that's it. And, and there'll be other ways that society will function. There'll be private security firms for security. There'll be private courts. There'll be uh, everything that you would want uh, would just be offered privately in much better forms, probably on an app on your phone. There's already an app called uh, Cell 411, I think. Um, that uh, essentially it's like calling 911, but it's an app uh, that uh, you get private services. So if you, you know, if there's a private security firm here and you've got a problem, some guy's freaking out over here, uh, you just press a button on your phone, a private security guy comes up and tries to help out with the situation, or if you have a medical emergency or whatever, the, there's uh, private ambulances or whatever. Um, so yeah, a lot of people kind of assume that what I talk about, uh, that's so far out of the bounds of, of reality that we can't even imagine what it would be like. It's really not. Um, it's it's just um, it's just changing how we do things from centralized to more decentralized. From more, uh, for example, what the the real elites, the people that Luke usually chases after, they want a one world government. I want seven billion governments on on Earth. So it's the exact opposite. But 
if people do want governments, they can have them. It's great, but allow me to opt out of them. That's what I want. And, um, you know, we'll see probably, we're going to see a lot of change in the next uh, few decades thanks to technology. And we'll see, for example, there's numerous anarcho-capitalist countries being built right now. One of them is called Lieberland. I just spoke at their event in London. Uh, it's probably going to get recognized by numerous countries fairly soon. Uh, and it'll become a real country, but it's run by anarcho-capitalists who believe that the government shouldn't be doing anything whatsoever, and it won't, and there'll be no taxes. And already there's been 500,000 people who have applied for citizenship. Uh, the, uh, there's been something like 10 or 20 or $30 billion that people have said, if Liberland really gets started as a real country, that businesses will move there uh, into the tens of billions of dollars. So it's already got a half a million people applying for it. It's got businesses wanting to move there. And if it becomes a reality, because it'll be so free market, it'll be incredibly prosperous. It'll be like Hong Kong times 10. That will show the world. And we just need to show the world different ways that things can work. And then as, through technology and through change and all these governments and all their central banks and all their fiat currencies are all going to collapse anyway. Uh, this is just math. Uh, the uh, US dollar, the Japanese yen, the U.S. now has $21 trillion worth of debt. Uh, the, it's getting to the point where it's basically the, the currency is going to have to hyperinflate or the U.S. government is going to have to go bankrupt. And the same for almost every government in the world. These systems have gone on for quite a while now and they're all nearing their, their end. So really all we're talking about here is how we can transition to a uh, very peacefully into a, a new, better, freer system from what we have today. And a lot of that is, comes from blockchain and cryptocurrencies. I have another question here. Hey, so first of all, I want to thank you for, you know, this opportunity to just to listen to what you have to say. And I have to say, what I really love is that how this conference, you know, went forward and that it shifted from just, you know, business and, you know, just talking about how you can get more of that to something that could benefit all of us, right? Just to make freedom, you know, to help people become more free you know, and create better lives for, you know, future generations. So basically the thing that I can relate to what you're talking, because I'm also talking about, you know, similar things, you know, consciousness and people become more aware of the things that are happening in our society. So basically I can highly relate to that. And, you know, all the things that, you know, mention, let's say, you know, governments, you know, that they're saying that governments trying to enslave people and stuff like that. You know, I'm a big believer that pe that governments will change like from within and stuff like people have to be separated like from governments, but it's more like the change will happen from that kind of side when more people, you know, more conscious people start to enter those governments, you know, start to change the system from that place, right? So basically, yeah, so my question is, would be more like hmm, a bit different than just, you know, right, maybe to, you know, cryptocurrency and stuff like that. How do you think, how did you become who you are now? How, what made you like, you know, so many people are like just doing things they do and just going to work, you know, taking care of the family businesses, but you're like, you know, doing something, you know, more than that. You're just spreading, you know, awareness and, you know, helping people, you know, become more wake up, you know, and, you know, how do you think this happened to you? How, how did you, you know, transform your own ways of thinking and stuff like that? Well, um, a lot of trauma, dealing with trauma, facing trauma, understanding it and overcoming it. Uh, and I still am not perfect. No one's perfect. We're all messed up in the head. Uh, but really, if you go through a lot of you know, hard times in your life, you're, you're either going to come out really bad because of it or a lot better. Um, so again, I see everything that happens as an opportunity, no matter how bad, no matter how horrible, what can I learn? How can I grow? Uh, I need to cope with this situation. I need to deal with this situation. Uh, and it's been very incremental. It's always been anti-establishment because I got beat up by the cops uh, all the time in New York City when I grew up in Brooklyn and was a part of the basketball team and they didn't like me. Um, you know, so that, you know, incrementally led me there. I saw the fraud of the whole taxation system when I got my first job and I worked at Subways and I had to make $5 an hour uh, you know, because of all these stupid taxes that are happening there. Uh, so it's all very incremental. Just uh, don't put too much pressure on yourself. You know, don't try to be anyone you're not. Uh, meditate, uh, do a gratitude journal, take care of yourself, and uh, just follow a path that is leading towards doing something for the service of others. 
uh, instead of just looking for money. I mean, there's been points of times where me and Jeff had a lot of money, had very little money. Our happiness didn't go up or decrease. Our happiness increases when we're doing something that's worthwhile, that's something that's powerful, and something that uh, is beyond us, outside of us. Uh, and that really, truly gives you purpose, uh, no matter how much zeros you have in your bank account. Yeah, I would just say um, it's really about purpose and following your passion. Um, it just so happens my passion tends to be in things that are real world changing sort of things. Uh, some other people, their passion might be basket weaving. They might wake up and that's all they think about and they want to weave a really good basket that day. That might be their passion. It just happens that mine is let's change this whole criminal system and make it like a lot better here on earth for everyone. Uh, that's just my passion, and Luke's passion, to an extent, is definitely uh, getting out there and confronting people and getting information out there and not standing for this uh, so-called mainstream media and press who we met at Bilderberg, and they admitted to us. We met, I didn't know who they were, but I don't watch television, uh, but it was the entire White House press corps, and we snuck into Bilderberg. That's a whole other story. I don't know if you told that I was out for a smoke, but... Um, and uh, we sit down with them, we told them that uh, they weren't actually there for Bilderberg. They're, they're there for the G20 meeting, which was the day before, and they were leaving the day before Bilderberg. And uh, we told them what Bilderberg was, and they're like, oh, we've never heard of it. We didn't know anything about it. And, uh, and Luke and, and Dan uh, Dix of Press for Truth and myself were there, and Luke and Dan said what they did. And the White House press card guys went, oh, you guys are uh, journalists. And, uh, and Luke and Dan looked at them like, yeah, like, like you guys, right? And they're like, no, we're not, no, we're not journalists. We, we're actors. We read off the, the, the screen. We, we don't do any journalism. And uh, I wish we got that on tape. Um, um, but anyway, I think a lot of people are starting to wake up that is actually the case. The, the, there's polls of people who watch the mainstream media now, and it's like 15% actually trust the information they're getting from it. So, uh, But yeah, it's about following your passion and, um, and just doing what, you know, like for me personally, I... I no, I'm not that interested in making a really good speaker or a really good flat screen TV. It's like, for whatever reason, I think more on like the systemic level and I, I want to change those systems. Uh, that's what my passion is. So I'm, I'm truly living my passion. And when you truly do, um, and Luke talked about depression and stuff like that, I, I had a, was really bad for a number of years. But once I really fixed a lot of stuff that was in my head uh, and uh, did a, so many things, and started to realize that what I'm really doing is truly living my passion. I'm sitting here at a cryptocurrency event, which they didn't even exist, exist 10 years ago, and now I'm talking about how this could change the whole world. Uh, it, to me, it's, it's amazing. And the fact that I'm involved in it, uh, and you know, that's, you know, a lot of people ask, how, how could I go to five conferences in the last eight days in, in uh, five different countries? You know, how do I do it? Well, because I'm kind of living my passion right now. And as, that's what everyone should be trying to do. And most people don't. Uh, you talk to your average person, what do you do? Well, I work down at the, the telephone, I work down at T-Mobile, I sell you know, packages. It's like, is that what you really like doing? It's like, no, then why are you doing it? Find what you really want to do. Everyone has a purpose, everyone has a passion. Most people don't realize that's what you should actually be trying to do. Instead of just sitting there for 40 years doing something you hate, waiting for your retirement, where you're going to find out at the very end of it, it's like it's not that great just to sit on a beach every day, unless that's your passion. Uh, but most people just uh, don't try to find the things that, that is their passion. And, and like Luke mentioned about money, it's not about money. Uh, in fact, if you do live by your passion and you follow your passion and and do those things, money just comes to you naturally. It's 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 almost like the universe's way of telling you you're you're on the right track. And really, money is they call it currency for a reason. It's literally a current. It's energy. So when you're on the right purpose, on the right path, all of a sudden things just start flowing your way. I don't know how to describe it. I don't know how it all works. Uh, but I, I've seen it so many times now that I know it's absolutely true. So if you're not living your passion, anyone here today, I would just advise you, like, if you're working in a job and you hate it, quit it. Like, right now, not tomorrow. Like, get on the phone right now and go, I quit. And a lot of people go, that's scary. What am I going to do? Don't worry. The universe, another door will open. I don't know how to explain how it works, but it, it seems to work. And a very quick question is um, maybe some lovely long answers, who knows, but uh, uh, really lovely stories. I think everybody would agree, personal stories, and they're better than anything. And David has mentioned about the power of stories, so thank you. But my question is, um, is 
particularly uh, to do with you, Jeff. Thank you very, very much for your very uh, moving, I think, um, story about education, compulsory education. You'll know, I think, that you know, there's a long history to that, and there's some also some very dark agendas involved in all that going way back. Um, we don't get a lot of time. We can't talk about everything here. Um, we haven't talked a lot about education, arguably, for so many of the things that many of us want to happen. It's not just education that we're involved in here, that many people here are in you know, publicizing and so on. It's not just about that. It's about primary, secondary education, um, but quite possibly of a decentralized, well, very absolutely possibly of a decentralized nature. Um, often some people call this homeschooling. Um, do you think um, that this will be possible under crypto, given the fact that, as you know, to do homeschooling, you need mama, papa, um, you know, you need at least one of them to have quite a lot of spare time, and you need to sort of build into community. So I think, I feel that there should be some possibilities in crypto, but I'm a, I'm a crypto virgin, so I know nothing. Um, can, you, can you give some ideas, maybe, in that area? Thank you. Well, I think it's, uh, all this stuff is possible right now, even without cryptocurrency. Um, people need to realize that the government public schools are, it's child abuse, it's a prison camp for kids. Uh, these kids are forced to go into them, forced to obey, forced to be obedient, have all the life sucked out of them in them. Uh, anyone here, if you have your kids in a government school, I would suggest you get them out of it like today, not tomorrow, and just have them at home and watch what happens. And all of a sudden, the family life's going to be better. Well, who said you take the kids away from families when they're like five years old and send them to a bunch of communist, uh, top-down, centrally planned teachers in a union to, you know, the, 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 the family should be together. Well, of course, this is all part of a higher agenda, a larger agenda where they keep people impoverished and regulated and taxed to death to the point where the, this was a, an agenda that they did very well in the 20th century. They got all the women into the workplace, uh, which really helped more to destroy the family. Once you start to destroy families, you start to destroy all of society, and they're doing that all on purpose. Uh, there's something out there called unschooling, which I like a lot more than homeschooling. And basically, there's no school whatsoever. And I've met numerous unschoolers. I actually, Dana Martin, who's the leader of the unschooling movement, is also the show manager at our conference in Arcapoco. And she does a unschooling event every year. And I've met numerous unschooled kids, and they are night and day different from any kid I've ever met in a government school. They, they're full of energy, uh, interest, curiosity. Uh, they're, they're alive. And you meet these other kids who've been in the indoctrination camps for five or six years, and they're just like, I just want to drink a beer or smoke a joint or something because I just got to get through this another five more years or whatever it is. Um, so all that's possible right now. The blockchain probably will change things, but you know it's funny because a lot of the uh, they call themselves anarcho-communists, but they're really just communists. The guys who go out and break windows at Starbucks and all that, and they go, "We want free education." It's like it is free. It's the internet. All information is there. Uh, they've just really fooled people into thinking you got to go to this place for 12 years as a kid and memorize and write down and get exams and um, that's not I was just thinking about this today I was gonna make a Facebook post I was gonna say life is education every I was just thinking about this today that's who the school that's crazy like life is education just me traveling here to Lithuania I've never been here this is an education, and I'm learning from other people. Every day is an education. It's not a place you go. Uh, that's, in fact, they call it education. It's really, it's not. It's, it's, it's actually not, <laughs> it's the opposite of education, really, for the most part. Uh, so it's all possible now, and I'm sure there's going to be numerous blockchain-related things that will possibly change things. I haven't personally heard about anything education-related cryptocurrency, but uh, I'm, I wouldn't doubt it if some people already are working on something. Okay, so uh, our discussion about centralized versus decentralized reminds me a little bit of discussion what is better, far-right political movement or far-left political movement. Don't you believe that the truth is, is always somewhere in between and what is the right balance? We just need to find the right balance between the two? Absolutely not. Uh, so basically what you're saying is there's complete tyranny and enslavement of humanity and there's freedom. Why can't we just find a nice balance? It's like, no, <laughs> let's go complete freedom. Now, if people don't want to do that, that's fine. And I would never force people to have to be free. And some people are actually very scared of being free. Um, and that's a, a big issue. 
but no, to find this nice middle ground is no, absolutely not. There's the evil and good. <laughs> and I'm not trying to find the middle ground there. Uh, and basically, when you look at government, what, what do they do, right? How does it exist? How do they get their money? Through taxation, which is just theft. It's extortion. Uh, so I'm not trying to find a nice middle ground where we can have some theft and some extortion. It's like, let's get rid of the whole thing altogether. Yeah. Well, fear, they use fear a lot of the times to control us into that paradigm. It's either you're with the crazy Antifa or the right-wing racist alt-righters. In reality, the spectrum is you're either going towards fear or you're going towards love, either going to freedom or total enslavement. You make that decision, and to me, uh, that's why it's very hard to even put me on a political compass because... Um, I don't play along those lines. Those lines are meant there to be there to divide and conquer people so we fight amongst each other instead of looking up and seeing, oh yeah, the controllers are manipulating this thing, promoting hyperbolic content, getting stupid things out there that make you react, that you know is the car crash that makes you stop your car and look at it, when in reality, uh, you know, you're, you're getting f f your whole car taken away from you. Uh, there's people taking away your tires and, and you know, it's slowly and surely as you're looking at a big car wreck that is our current political landscape, uh, the government's siphoning gas out of your gas tank uh, and, and, you know, propelling you from not going as further in life as you would, would normally go. Uh, so to me, really just looking up is really the best way and uh, going against people who try to use force against you is the most important issues and it's really that issue instead of the left and right issue that people need to know about. All right, we have a question here. Um, hello, so during the conversation I thought about this inflation and deflation thing and uh, I make some, uh, some thoughts, so I read it here. Uh, on the issue on, on deflation, I think uh, deflation maybe will not happen because of forks, see Bitcoin. So if there's a need for, no, uh, for more coins, they will be created. And inflation maybe will not happen because coins are developed to use them. So if the community decides to don't use the coin, it will continue to exist, but will not be used and stays at a limit value. This is what its actual uh, fiat money system isn't doing. The money gets more and more and the value of the things are um, priced higher. And so a lot of people during infl inflation don't get the same amount. And at the end, the people can't afford less. This is my question. Maybe we can do it with these forks to get the problem. Yeah, it, that's what I was saying. Like, these things will evolve over time, and we'll see. If deflation becomes an issue with some of these cryptos, then I, I'm pretty sure that these cryptos will just change if, they, if it becomes like a major problem. Uh, but we ha we've yet to really see what happens when we have true deflation, and w we don't really know what's going to happen. And, and th these are things for the cryptos to work out, and yeah, things like forks and all these sort of things. You know, anyone can do any of these sort of things, right? You can do your own fork of Bitcoin if you want. Most people probably won't care, but, uh, you know, we have the capability and the options to try everything now and, and see what works, and, and that's what's going to happen over the next few years. So I think what you guys are talking about really resonates with uh, what Pillar is for as well and why many of us got involved with Pillar is really nice. I can imagine you guys must be getting tired. I do have two other questions. Are you still up for it? Should we continue? Because I imagine you guys, I mean, we could just talk for the whole day. 6 a.m. <laughs> talking. <laughs> All right, here. Thank you. Guys, fantastic presentations. This is a really... Um, quick answer question. You're really well traveled. Can you tell us where you think are the most crypto friendly countries in the world and the least crypto friendly countries? Uh, the least is uh, the US is right up there. Truly, I tell a lot of people who are involved in blockchain technology, if you live in the US, just get out. It's very dangerous, uh, very unfree. Um, I've heard about numerous places uh, that uh, are really seem to be trying to uh, bring in a lot of crypto by having like very little regulations, no taxation, all that kind of stuff. I don't have any many personal, I haven't been there, like I've heard Gibraltar's doing something, I've heard something about Malta, I've heard something about Cyprus, even heard something about Lithuania, that there's a lot of crypto people moving here. Um, yeah, uh, basically just stay out of the U.S. if you're involved in crypto. 
Malta is very good. There's a lot of Bitcoin companies going down there. So is South Korea. They just passed new regulations that legitimize Bitcoin and cryptocurrencies in South Korea right now. As far as the really bad ones, of course, Venezuela. When we were down there, they would put people in jail if they were mining Bitcoin. Uh, and also Somalia. At the time I was sponsored by Dash, I was trying to give cryptocurrencies to anyone in Somalia for any kind of transaction or product. And uh, people were like, uh, no, no, not going to happen here. Um, as we were walking around the fish market with everyone with AK-47s and, and machetes, we were like, I'll buy the fish, but download this app on your phone, please. And they're like, uh, no, 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 we don't want it. We just want hard cash. So Somalia is not that friendly as well. Uh, last question? Yep, one second. Loads of questions I wanted to ask, but when you were in Somalia, there is a big distinction between Somalia and Somali land. Do you know that? Did, did, and, and it was the same to your knowledge in both both sides? Yeah, well, yeah. Somaliland actually does work in, in official diplomatic relations with Liberland, uh, and it's its own territory that kind of lives in a more peaceful, harmonious state compared to, uh, you know, the real Somalia, which is separated with a lot of uh, not only gang violence, but also a lot of international governments. People call it anarchy, but it's not really anarchy. It's governments vying for power down there. Turkey, the UAE, Saudi Arabia, AFRICOM, the United States all operate there, and they all make the situation uh, a lot worse, uh, whether on purpose or on accident. Uh, their effect is profound in that specific region. We're talking about U.S. Uh, conducting military raids that killed innocent people. Uh, I interviewed one person that lost 13 members of his entire family because of a failed botched U.S. raid on his farm. Uh, there's also other governments like Turkey and the UAE going down there, and they're uh, giving out weapons to you know new military Somali forces, and the Somali military guys are like, I'm hungry. I'm just going to sell my weapon to Al Shabaab because they're going to give me money, and I'm able to get some food. Uh, so Al Shabaab literally gets their weapons from uh, the people trying to fight Al Shabaab. So it makes no sense at all uh, over there. Yeah, I, I was. Um we went to Somalia, but we didn't have a chance to get to Somaliland, and I was kind of sad about that, but I, I, one day in Somalia, and we just wanted to leave, <laughs> like, <laughs> it was so bad. Um, but yeah, we've actually done a deal with them, Liberland, the neo anarcho capitalist country. Uh, they were one, the, the first, I think, to recognize Liberland, Somaliland. Somaliland's been around for decades. Uh, it really hasn't gotten recognized too much. I hear it's almost complete anarchy, and because of that, it's like super nice, but I, we didn't get the chance to go. Maybe we'll, maybe we'll go back sometime soon. <laughs> That's it. Guys, thank you so much. Amazing, inspiring discussion, very much un, very fitting to unconference and uh, a special mention here for Mr. James Fairhead who yesterday came and said like, yeah, yeah, you're talking a lot about technology, about how it will unfold, but we need to talk about what is really around that and, and how it will be shaping society, uh, human progress and and, and how it will uh, shape our relationships with, with the power, basically. So I think that was a bit of, a bit of that, and, and I'm really happy that we could spend this time here with Jeff, with, uh, with Luke, and with you guys, because that's also a warm applause for yourself. Please do it. Thank you. Uh, Jacek, do you want to mention about tomorrow, what's going on, and uh, what's for the